Hello, welcome back to the channel. So this is uh, quite an exciting video. It's my first history talk video. So what I'm going to be doing today is running through what I'm going to be doing on the night of my first history talks project. I'm going to talk a wee bit about the project and then I'm going to run into my first one. And the first one is all about the Macedonian phalanx. So we're going to be hosted at the ACVC, Alan Clark's Veteran Craftsman Hub at, in Glasgow. Uh, it's a great charity, a great space, and it's to help veterans with crafts as pottery, painting, model making, pyrography, woodworking, leather working, you name it, if it's crafts, it's available. And during the day, the venue is open for veterans to go, and people with mental health as well, to go and uh, get the help they need just by focusing and stuff. And on the night, we've got various things. We've got wargaming going on. We're doing stuff like this history. Uh, talk. So I would like to thank Alan and all the staff at the Hub for hosting us. But the History Talks themselves was an idea I had in 2019. Uh, I went along to the Waterloo Great Game replayed event in Glasgow. Kelvin Hall, it was uh, 25,000 figures, 24, 25,000 figures, 100 players, and it was organised by Tony Pollard, who is a professor of battlefield archaeology, and he works with a charity called Waterloo Uncovered. Now, what Waterloo Uncovered does is it takes uh, veterans to uh, Waterloo every year and do archaeology. Similar sort of thing like uh, happens here with the hub is that archaeology is like focus and tension and it helps people, a worthy cause indeed. But as part of that, what the hub, uh, what the great game did was on the Thursday before and they had a series of lectures and they had one of the lecture halls at the university and hadn't been in a lecture hall for years so that was a great experience in itself and uh, there were half hour blocks and it was stuff like uh, Scots Grays taking the eagle there was how the battle was commemorated afterwards archaeology put my teeth back in archaeology of the site and how what they'd uncovered uh, help them understand better what happened at Hougamon and uh, loads more, uh, you know, just a, a general talk about the, the um, what Loom Covered charity as well. And I had the idea of taking that and running with it more often. In my local village, there's a group that meets up, look like a local history, local talk group, um, and they do something similar. And I thought, what if we did something similar for military history? Maybe it's in Glasgow on an evening, get a pub function room. Now, I know um, both professional historians and amateur historians, myself from history degree level and a war gamer and I go down uh, rabbit holes of research and stuff. So there's loads of stuff I know. So I thought it'd be really good to put on a fellowship, create a fellowship, if you will, where we do these military talks. And what I want is people like yourselves to do military talks. So it's not just about me finding uh, various people who can talk on subjects, but also want you guys to come forward and, and we can chat about it and stuff as well. So, yeah, I want you to be as inspired as I was to get out there and share your, your learning and knowledge. So we're going to be running monthly, but we'll also interspace it with maybe some military quizzes, uh, as for fundraising, raffles, all sorts of stuff. But we've, we've got big plans for the Hub this year. And for you guys in YouTube land, I hope to share as much of it as I can on my YouTube channel as possible. So if you do like what you see, do subscribe. And I'm always interested in your thoughts on stuff as well. So here is my talk, my humble effort, which we'll be talking about um, the army of Alexander the Great, but specifically focusing on the phalanx. Now, Ancient armies, in fact, scrap that, any army is only as good as its general, and a general is only as good as its army. One needs to support the other. And Alexander the Great was a great general. He wouldn't get the name great. Um, even like Hannibal Barker would rate Alexander as the best ancient general. Um, Scipio, you know, he gained the name the Great for a reason. But what was great about him, his army, the bedrock of his army was the phalanx. And that's what we're going to talk about today. 
At its heart, phalanx is just a massive group of men armed with spears. Dead simple. And if it was as simple as that, I'd just go home right now. No, but what the Alexander did was he inherited the army that his father had built, Philip II of Macedon. At its basic level, its organisation was based around groups of 16 men. Now, I'm going to butcher a load of Macedonian names, so I do apologise. So 16 men were led by a squad leader or a, a, a decadak. Um, and the squad leaders generally would be at the front of the files, get paid three times more the wage of a regular phalangite. He would be backed up by two more or three more veterans. So when we are talking about how the phalanx fight, know that the veterans were in front. 16 of these files would be organised to create a battalion of 256 men called the Syn Syntagma. Again, pronunciation, I do apologise. And six of those would then form a taxi. The, the group of 256 men was the smallest battlefield formation that would operate. And then you would get the taxis. Now, the interesting thing about the taxis was Philip, when he... Uh, ascended to the throne of Macedonia. Now he wasn't first in line to throne. I think he was third in line to throne. His brother and his uh, brother's son came before him. He inherited a fractured kingdom. Southern Macedonia was the area controlled by the royal household. North Macedonia was more unruly. unruly. Philip was a great diplomat and when he created his army he made sure that there was as many people from North Macedonia involved in that army, given con uh, joining his royal household companion knights or being officers in the phalanxes. Now these taxis were all provincial based around Macedonia. A couple of things where it tied the army together. The second thing it did was I think it takes a, a brave man to be a coward in front of your peers. It takes an even braver man to be a coward in front of your peers when those peers will know your family, your background, all sorts of family links, almost like the uh, PALS battalions in World War One, or, or just generally the British Army recruitment where you've got this regiment is from County Durham, they are the Durham Light Infantry and all the people are from Durham. So you've got a real family connection there, um, different links throughout that regiment. So that's a basic organisation and the phalanxes would form up uh, 16 men deep and however many wide. The army that Ma uh, Philip took, Alexander took into Macedonia, uh, into Persia when he invaded Persia, was 9,000 men, six taxis at the base of his phalanx. Now, interestingly enough, when there were casualties in the taxi, those recruits would come from the area that that taxi was recruited from. So they were filter in and so those troops would always be tied together. And now equipment. This is where the Macedonian army comes into its own. So we are talking about phalanxes and pipe blocks and the Macedonian army had a fearsome weapon called the Sarissa. And it wasn't fearsome in say the, the falcs of the Thracians and Dacians or the stabbing spears, uh, stabbing swords of the Romans, it was a much longer spear than any other army was using at the time. To give you an idea, the Sarissa was around six metres long, whereas his enemies, the Greek hoplites and the Persian spearmen, their spears were roughly two and a half, maybe three metres long. So straight away there, this massive pike, the Sarissa, has got a a length that the enemy doesn't have. Interesting enough as well, to aid a manoeuvre, um, halfway up the Sarissa could be broken apart, carried, which meant it was much easier to transport. Also if it broke, part of it broke, you only had to replace half of it rather than the whole pike itself. But it wasn't just the longer spear which gave the Macedonian phalangite, which is the name of one of the soldiers that fought in the pike block. They also had a, a shield, and the shield was kind of held on the neck over the shoulder, and it was much smaller than the hoplite shield. Um, the 
shield is called a Telman. Telman. And what this did, because it was connected by the neck with straps, it allowed you to fight with your pipe with two hands. If you think the hoplites that the Macedonians would first fight, big Apis shield can only really have one with their spear. If you've got your two spears, two hands on your on your big pike, you've obviously got a lot more force and a lot more control with that fighting at a distance. The phalangites also cut down on the amount of armour and equipment they were carrying. Basically they would have a helmet, a shin protection and something on the breastplate with a small clip. Actually meant they were carrying much less weight uh, than the hoplites. Um, if the hoplites carried 40 pounds worth of equipment, the Macedonian ones equivalent was about 30. And that meant the troops were much fresher for longer. And it'd be worth just pointing out when we're talking about the differences in the equipment, when the army would go into Persia, Persian armies were vast hordes of troops and often much less well armoured, if any armour, than their adversaries. So even though the phalanx had less armour than the hoplites, they were able to best the hoplites. When they got to Persia, they were fighting enemies which were much less armoured, which obviously would give them not just a, an offensive uh, bonus with their longer reach of their weapons, but also a defensive bonus in terms of armour. Now training. The ancient warfare was seasonal. And whilst most armies would have a core of troops that would be always on hand, like raw bodyguards, for example, say the Persian immortals, uh, most troops would form up in March and be back home to do their farming in September. Certainly with the Greek hoplites, it was based around the idea of citizenship. And March, if I've got my uh, QI facts right, is named after Mars, I've got a war for Romans, which is when the armies would assemble and venture out. But what Macedonia had was access to some great mineral mines, gold, silvers, and this is what Philip used to pay for his army. That meant he could have his phalanx training at all times. Which meant that the, in terms of training, if you've got this almost amateur, we're going to go out every year, we're going to move to the borders of our forces and fight the, the, the next city over, compared to true professional soldiers, who's going to have the edge there? The Macedonians are going to have the edge. Even greater in terms of... Um, the Persian levies, the kind of Persian cavalry would be the kind of professional, more professional elite warriors. And then the Persian infantry would just be hordes thrown together. Not terribly well armed, big shields, bows. Certainly not a match for the Macedonians as we're going to see later on. Not only were troops trained, but they needed to be fit as well. And a lot of uh, emphasis was put on fitness and feeding the army. Let's face it, when you are in battle and you've got a six metre pole and you haven't used that a lot, that's going to take a lot of weight to keep that up. Um, and to help with that, Philip thought about the supplies for his army. And why that was important was Philip coming from a sort of a, a Greco world. The different city-states would essentially be fighting on their home turf or be supplied by the sea. If you look at the, where the Greek colonies formed, it was around the coastal areas of the Mediterranean. But when you're meeting, and there's only so many places you can actually meet for a sort of hoplite phalanx warfare in Greece, because Greece is actually a very sort of mountainous country. So there were certain areas bordering states where armies would always meet. But Philip knew his army would be penetrating deep into enemy territory. And he wanted to maintain a strategic initiative. So he made a lot of supply changes to the army. So whilst an army traditionally would move, would have loads of servants and slaves and baggage and hangers-on, camp followers, ladies of negotiable affection, following the army, 
what Philip did was cut all that out. He said, you can have one servant for every cavalry man and one servant for every file of troops to help carry, carry your millstones and provide services. And I believe he had his uh, oxen replaced with horses so the whole army could move fast. It's estimated that the army, the Macedonian army, could move twice as fast as its opponents. This has the other upside of requiring to go a distance. We're talking distance here. Um, if it takes me three days and you six days to go, I need half as much food and supplies to do that distance than you do. Water sources, for example. Um, ancient armies could carry grain, uh, sort of that sort of food ground down basically would not really go off maybe supplement it with some hunting and collecting of uh, more fresh fruits and stuff critically it was water and it's estimated the ancient armies could have three days worth of water stored in amphora before that water started to spoil and become brackish so an army could never be more than three days from a water source or it's going to really start to suffer and degrade um, let's not talk about the time when Alexander decided to march his army across the desert. That was punishment to those boys. But So if you're moving twice as fast as the enemy, it means you can be twice as far away from it. It gives you the strategic, strategic initiative. So if you're pushing into Persia, it gives you a lot more options than the Persian army which was opposing you. Now tactics. Macedonian tactics were pretty relatively simple rel relatively effective most tactics that are simple are effective keep it simple stupid so the phalanx would form up in the middle generally of the macedonian army it would be supported by skirmishers in front uh different sort of infantry called hydropasts probably is on the flanks in the rear, it would often have um, mercenary hoplites or allied uh, hoplites behind it. And what Philip would do was when he conquered you, he would take elements of your troops to become sort of allied contiguous hostages, if you will, as well, to, to guarantee your good behaviour. Uh, Alexander would continue this throughout his invasion of Persia. You would have your phalanx advancing. Now, when we see big blocks of spears, we often think that might be a defensive formation. Certainly, and we're also massively into Napoleonic history, and we see the idea of like brandishing um, like squares of infantry with bayonets out to the enemy, very defensive and static. Well, actually, no. The Hoplite style of warfare was to kind of charge at the enemy, engage the shields, and start fighting. The phalanx would advance. The front ranks would have their spears. So you'd have a wall of about five spears. It's about far back as you could get. And then the others would be up like this. And the phalanx would advance. Boom, boom, boom. One of the things I think the Macedonians had learned from the Spartans was the value of keeping your troops relatively quiet so that you're able to give and deliver any orders. Uh, the other thing that they'd learned from warfare in Greece is the way um, phalanxes and blocks of troops naturally move to the right. So if you've got your shield and you've got your spear, kind of move it to the right to try and put your shield up in front of the enemy. So what certainly the Thebans did, and uh, Philip spent time with the Thebans before he went back to Macedonia, was develop attack by echelon of phalanxes to, to kind of cut down on that sort of drifted to the right. But ultimately the phalanx was there to pin and hold the enemy battle line in place. If you're thinking the length of spears, the enemy's fighting at a distance, what Alexander would then do is he would look for a weakness in the line, and that's where he would hit with his companion cavalry. Smash a hole in the line, break a flank, or charge directly at the enemy like we see at Galgamela. It's one of the biggest, most important battles of Alexander, and I can't pronounce it. Occasionally the phalanx would find itself in difficulty, but having that second line of hoplites meant that troops were able to move and deal with anything as these taxis advanced. If the hole developed, anything came through, which would be the traditional bane and death of a phalanx. The weakness of a phalanx is the flanks and the rear. So if you think you've got all your troops 
angling forward, if you're in the middle of that pipe block, you're not going to know what's happening. You can get around the flanks, that's the traditional weakness of the phalanx. Uh, but those hot flights would deal with it. Effectiveness. At its peak, Alexander's army in Persia numbered more, no more than 50,000 troops. 9,000 phalangites, his companions, and then all the other troops he gained on top. Persian armies at the time varied in size according to sources from 200,000 to a million. And obviously we've got to cut through ancient bias and stuff for all of that. Um, but what was consistent was even in the face of these massive armies, the Macedonians would win and win handsomely because their casualty numbers almost seemed un unbelievably low. One point, I think it was a battle of Isis where Isis, where um, the Macedonians suffer about 200, 300 casualties, and we're looking at 100,000 casualties for the Persians. Galgamela, you know, the Macedonians might have suffered, and the Allied troops might have suffered up to 5,000 casualties, 4,500 wounded, 500 dead, but we're talking again hundreds, 200, 300,000 Persian losses. And this is simple. Now, I don't believe these casualties were caused by the, the phalanx in the middle fight, fight for hours on end, just stabbing Persians, advance, stabbing Persians, advance. What would have happened is as Alexander exploited his breakthrough and, um, and when Darius invariably fled the, fled the battlefield, why would his army, which was basically a levy horde, uh, remain on the field when their generals gone? That's when an army would break. When an army breaks, that's when it's at its most dangerous. That's when more casualties are going to occur. So if your phalanx has been doing most of the fighting, you've got some great cavalry. Not only did the Macedonians have their uh, companions, but they also had uh, Thessaly uh, cavalry as well, plus hordes of light infantry. That's when an army flees. That's when the casualties are going to occur as a uh, enemy cavalry uh, are going to hunt down and destroy your fleeing troops. And let's face it, as you're fleeing, it's, there's, there's loot of hoi boys and uh, ancient armies lived on loot. Now, one thing that the phalanx did do, Persians relied a lot on archery, and the phalanx, the, the arrows at the back, the pikes at the black, it's believed would interfere with the ar archers. So if you're looking at like 200,000 Persian art, Persians, 50,000 might have been archers, that's a lot of archery. It just shows the effectiveness of those pikes intercepting those arrows. So a bit of counterfactual. History is all about counterfactual to lean up with. Could Alexander have defeated Rome? That's the question. Um, yes. Now, my beloved Hannibal couldn't. But what we saw with Pyrrhus, uh, where we get to the Pyrrhic victory, uh, basically a Macedonian-style general invaded or was involved in battles in Rome, and he was able to defeat the Rome at what cost? Quite a high cost, so we'll get to a third victory from, but his phalanxes were able to defeat the Romans. Now, if you tied that with Alexander, with his better cavalry, better great grasp of tactics, he would be able to totally annihilate Roman armies. That's my belief anyway. And he would have got victories like Hannibal. However, unlike Hannibal, one of the things I just have not mentioned in this is siege train. Alexander had a great siege train and a great mind about him with uh, besieging any enemy cities, castles, fortifications. There's nothing Hanno, uh, Alexander couldn't do if he put his mind to it. So in conclusion, we discussed the phalanx, which is the background, backbone of Alexander's armies. Um, to, upon his deathbed, uh, when asked who should inherit his kingdom, since he had no children, he said to the strongest, which led to the successors and successor wars. And they drew the wrong lesson. They wanted bigger and bigger pipe blocks. They didn't see what Alexander was necessarily doing with the cavalry as winning the fights. So eventually, the pipe blocks, without the brilliance of Alexander and other elements playing in, lost ground and Rome swallowed up most of the successor kingdoms. They also liked talk quickly about a parallel to the British army if we think about what Alexander's doing there uh, strong regional recruiting just like Britain with his battalions uh, strong reliance on NCOs they were the backbone of Alexander's army and as it went on the experience they gained was second to none 
uh, training, regular training, just like the British Army being one of the few British uh, armies during the Napoleonic period to practice often with live musketry. Alexander's army was trained and in peak condition to fight and finally pulling auxiliaries in to serve around the phalanx so the phalanx could focus on being the phalanx, the key battle winning instrument it was, and let other arms of the army deal with what needs to happen. So I thank you all for listening. Um, it's been really good delivering my first one. Hope it goes as good as this on the night itself. Can't see why it wouldn't. Just try not to be distracted to stay on time. So that's goodbye from now. If you've got any thoughts on Alexander and his phalanx, and that was a brief 101, do share in the comments. I'd love to hear from him. And uh, thanks for watching. Bye for now.